Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Estrina Nikolova is the Diane Harkins Coughlin and Christopher J. Coughlin Sesquicentennial Assistant Professor of Marketing at the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. Her research focuses on joint decision-making, interpersonal relationships, social influence, consumer self-control, and interventions to promote healthy choices. Her research has been featured in Time, Forbes, The Washington Post, The Huffington Post, New York Magazine, ABC News, and many other sources. We're very pleased to have her here today to talk to us about how consumers make joint decisions. Thank you very much, Earl. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. It's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to share with you my work on joint decision making and hopefully offer some valuable insight that can be useful for marketers. So let's get started. Most of my research focuses on understanding how consumers make decisions jointly with others and how those joint decisions might differ from the individual decisions they make on their own. The motivation and inspiration from, for this research came from the fact that most of the literature on consumer decision making, with a few exceptions, examines how individual consumers make decisions alone. However, in reality, consumers make decisions jointly with others. In fact, in so many industries, decisions are more likely to be made jointly than individually. So let me give you an example. A recent survey by ING conducted in 2017 indicates that 87% of consumers indicate that when it comes to holiday planning and holiday decisions, they are more likely to make the decision jointly with someone else rather than alone. Similarly, for durable goods, 87% of consumers indicate that durable good decisions are more likely to be made jointly rather than alone. The same holds true for dining out or selecting restaurants and also new car purchases. As we can see, joint decisions are prevalent in many industries, but we as academic researchers and also as marketers do not quite understand how they are different from the individual decision. In most cases, marketers actually target individual and joint decision makers in the same way using the same strategies. So today I'm going to share with you some of my insights that I have uncovered in my research on joint decision making. I'm going to focus the majority of my time on one research project that examines whether gender matters when consumers make joint decisions involving the compromise effect. This is the first item on the agenda and I'll get to what the compromise effect is in a second. And then, if time permits, I'll discuss briefly a few other insights from my research on joint decision making, particularly focusing on financial decision making, ethical choices, and different product choices. So what is the compromise effect? Since this would be the foundational element of what the majority of the presentation would be about today. Let me illustrate it with an example. Imagine that consumers have to choose between two different types of microwaves. We have option A that is smaller and cheaper, and then we have option B which is larger and more expensive. If consumers are faced with this particular choice set, they are likely to be equally split between the two options. So for example, 57% of consumers would go for option A, 43% of consumers would go for option B. However, imagine that we add a third option, which is option C, which is much larger and more expensive than both options A and B. In these three item choices, the choice share of option B would significantly increase. So while we have consumers, or only 43% of consumers choosing option B in the two item choices, we see that when we add an additional option that makes option B the intermediate option, we see a significant increase in the choice share. And this is exactly what the compromise effect is, or basically the addition of an not, not an inferior but extreme option to a given choice set increases the choice share of the option that becomes the intermediate alternative. Or simply said, it's basically the tendency of consumers to prefer intermediate or compromise alternative, alternatives and also avoid the extreme. These intermediate middle alternatives are easier to justify, and that's why consumers are, exhibit stronger preference for them. Marketers have long used the compromise effect to influence the way consumers shop. 
So, for example, if marketers wanted consumers to select option X, they made sure that option Y was lower price and option Z was higher price than the focal product. The effect has been very well established, very well supported and influential for years. So just to give you a few examples of its effectiveness. The medium size cup is the most frequently purchased coffee size in the United States according to the National Coffee Association survey from 2017. Similarly, the second lowest priced wine on the wine list is usually the best seller and the most profitable one. So the way that marketers use the compromise effect is that by making the most profitable option that they may want to increase the sales of, being a middle alternative in a given choice. And then just another example, a large scale field study of uh, taxi riders in New York City revealed that customers are more likely to tip 25% if 25% is the middle option of the three suggested tip percentages rather than if it's one of the extreme options. So just to summarize, the compromise effect is a very established phenomenon in behavioral economics, widely used by marketers, and it refers to the tendency to prefer these middle options in given choices. The problem is that the compromise effect has always been studied as individual decisions. And something that would be important for the research that I'm going to share with you today is that men and women are equally likely to prefer compromise options in their individual decisions. But are all of these consumer decisions that involve the compromise effect actually made individually? As you can probably intuit, the answer is no. In our own pilot study, we found that many of the decisions that have been used to demonstrate the compromise effect in the literature are decisions that are more likely to be made jointly than individually. So for example, consumers indicate that more than 90% of the travel, home buying and apartment rentals restaurant selection decisions they make are joint decisions rather than individual ones. The same holds true for car purchases, event tickets purchases, and also household appliances. And just these six categories that you can see on the screen represented 3.1 trillion US dollars in 2017, or 17.4% of the GDP of the United States in 2017. So these are important categories. Consumers make a lot of joint decisions in those categories, but we don't know if the compromise effect would emerge in these joint decisions. So the substantive problem that we are going to try to solve together today is whether designing choice sets based on the compromise effect always effective for marketers. In other words, we are assuming that everyone will prefer the intermediate option and avoid the extremes always work. What if the target market makes the yadic decisions or decisions in pairs? And are all the different types of decision-making pairs going to be alike? If we understand how joint decisions are different from individual ones, we can basically help marketers design choice sets more effectively and also improve the success of their targeting strategies. So let's illustrate this substantive problem with an example. Let's consider a vacation planning decision. Imagine that we are going to Turks and Caicos. So the choice set consists of three different options. First, we have option A, which is the Oasis at Grace Bay. It's 255 per night. And the average rating, according to consumers' reviews, is four out of five. Option B, seven stars, resorts, and spa, 459 per night. The average consumer rating is 4.5 out of 5. And then the pound, Turks and Kaifu, 6.25 per night, so it's the most expensive option, but also the option that has the best review, so it, it has a review rating of 5 out of 5. So if we have a consumer planning a solo trip, research on the compromise effect would basically suggest, regardless of whether they are male or female, they will exhibit a stronger preference for the middle compromise option. So it's very likely that they'll go for option B since it offers medium performance on the two attributes that we are interested in, which in this case is the price and the review rating. In other words, making the most profitable option, the option that one may want to increase the sales of a middle alternative will work for solo trips. But as we saw earlier, a lot of the travel and vacation planning decisions are more likely to be made by pairs of consumers or couples. 
Therefore, it is interesting to see what would happen if you have, for example, a male and a female decision maker planning the vacation together. Will they be as likely to choose the compromise alternative as individual decision makers, or will they prefer one of the two extreme options? Also, what if we have two female consumers planning a women's getaway together? Again, the research is silent on whether they would go for option B, the compromise alternative, or one of the extremes. And then also, if we have a men's getaway, two male decision makers planning a vacation together, maybe a bachelor's weekend, we don't know again if they'll exhibit the same preference for the compromise options as we have seen in individual decision makers. So to summarize, in all of these three cases, it is unclear whether the three different types of diet will exhibit a stronger preference for option B, as individual consumers, or will they prefer one of the extremes? So it is not clear whether when you have the Yadik decision makers, placing the most profitable option as a middle alternative will work. And it is also not clear whether that would work depending on the different gender composition of the diet. So the research questions that we will investigate are, do diets exhibit the same compromise effect tendencies as shown in individual decisions? Are there any differences among mixed gender, female-female, and male-male diets? And if there are any differences, why do they exist, and how can we mitigate them? So let me show you the empirical evidence that we have gathered to answer these questions. In the first empirical investigation, we recruited participants in the lab, and we asked them to make decisions either individually or jointly with somebody else. In that way, we created five different types of decision makers. So we had male-male decision-making pair, female-male decision-making pair, female-female pair, and then female and male individual decision makers. In this particular study, we asked them to think about buying an electric grill. And we presented them with the following three options. Option A, which has the smallest size from the three, and it is also the lightest. Option B, medium size, medium weight. And option C, which is the larger size and the heavier weight. As you can see, options A and C represent the extreme options in this given choice set. And option B, the one that offers medium performance on size or the cooking area and the weight, is the compromise alternative. So will everyone make the same choices in this particular choice context? Here, you can see the percentage of consumers choosing the compromise option or grill B, option B. What we can see is that 70% of male decision makers, when they make solo decisions, they choose the compromise option. Similarly, for female decision makers making individual decisions, 74.2% of them would go for the compromise option. So we replicate what we have seen in prior research. For mixed gender diet, we see that about 69% of them are also likely to choose the compromise option. Similarly, for female-female pair, 72.1% of them choose the compromise option. So, so far we have seen a consistent, a consistent emergence of the compromise effect across the individual decision makers and any decision-making pairs that involve a female decision maker. Interestingly, when you have two male decision makers making a decision together, we see that they are significantly less likely to choose the compromise option than individual consumers and also mixed gender and female diets. So male pairs are less likely to choose the compromise alternatives in given choice sets when they have to make this joint decision. Before I show you the next empirical investigation, I would like to take a step back and basically explain the different ways that we can use to capture the magnitude of the compromise effect. The first one is the one that we used in the first study, which I just showed to you, and basically involves presenting consumers with a three-item choice set and taking the choice share of the intermediate compromise alternative as a measure of the magnitude of the compromise effect. The second one, which is called the relative share change measure, is a measure in which we present half of the consumers with a core 
two item sets consisting of two options. And then the other half of the consumers are presented with the extended set that consists of three options. So we add option C. And the way that we capture the magnitude of the compromise effect here is by taking the change of the choice share of option B between the core and the extended set, or between before and after option B becomes the middle alternative. So this is the method that we are going to use to capture the compromise effect in the next empirical investigation that I'm going to show you. So basically, we want to demonstrate that we see consistent findings regardless of which measure we use of the compromise effect. So in the next study, again, we recruited participants in the lab, and we had five different types of decision makers. Again, male and female individuals making solo decisions, male-female pairs, female-female pairs, and then male-male pairs. And we presented them with one of two different choices. All of them were asked to think about buying a printer that they're going to use together, and they were presented with one of two different choices. The first one is the core set, which contained two different brands of printers, A and B, that differed on text quality and text cost expressed in cents per page. The second half of the participants were presented with the extended set, which contained three different brands. So in addition to options A and B that we saw in the core set, now we have option C which is a much higher quality than both A and B, and also it's much more expensive in terms of text cost. So the way that we are going to capture the compromise effect here is by looking at whether there is a change in the choice share of option B in the core and then in the extended set. If there is a significant increase in the choice share of option B between the core and the extended set, we can see that the compromise effect has emerged. So here on the screen, you can see the percentages of pairs or individual decision makers choosing option B in both the core and the extended set. So let's start with the individual decision makers again. Male consumers, when they have to make decisions alone, 17% of them choose option B in the core set, but that choice share significantly increases to about 52% in the extended set. So the choice share of option B increases between before and after it becomes the middle alternative, which suggests that male individual, male decision makers actually exhibit a compromise effect. The same thing happens for female individual decision makers, for mixed gender diets, and also for female, female pairs. For all four types of decision makers, we see that the choice share of option B significantly increases in the extended set, which suggests that they demonstrate the compromise effect. Interestingly, and consistently with what we found in our first empirical investigation, we see that the choice share of option B doesn't move between the core and the extended set for male-male decision-making pairs. So when two male decision makers have to make a joint decision together, they don't exhibit the compromise effect. So regardless, of whether we use two different measures of the compromise effect, two different product categories, we still see the same consistent effect. In the third empirical investigation, we wanted to demonstrate that the effect would hold with consequential choices and also in a, in a different product category. So here we focus on the decision-making pair because prior research has already established that individual decision-makers exhibit the compromise effect. So in this study, we asked participants first to complete a set of individual tasks. And then at the end of the session, we pair them together to create the three different types of pairs and ask them to select thank you prizes for their participation in the study. So the first prize was a gift card for a restaurant. And they had the option to choose among three different types of restaurants. Restaurant A, which has the lowest entry price of $10, but had the highest wait time of 15 minutes. Restaurant B, medium entry price and medium wait time of $15 and 10 minutes respectively. And then restaurant C, the most expensive one, but uh, the average wait time was the shortest of five minutes. The second price was for a pair of headphones. Here we have three different types of headphones. 
that differs based on their compatibility with other devices and durability. As you can see, headphones A are not very compatible with other devices, but they are very durable. Headphones C, extremely compatible with other devices, but the durability is poor. And then headphones B, medium compatibility and durability with us, and durability. So in the two choices, option B represent the middle compromise alternative. And here on the graph, you can see the percentage of pairs that choose the compromise option across the two different choices. 70% of the mixed gender pairs go for the compromise alternative, so restaurant B and headphones B. Similarly, 65% of the female-female pairs go for the compromise alternative. But male-male pairs are significantly less likely to choose the compromise options in the two different choices. So again, even with consequential choices, we see evidence that male-male consumers prefer the extremes and less likely to prefer the, the compromise option. Just to summarize what we have found so far, is that the compromise effect basically emerges in the individual decisions of solo consumers, as we have seen in prior research, and also in pairs that involve a female decision maker. But they're less likely to emerge in the, the joint decisions of male-male pairs. So the question is, why does this occur? So let me, um, let me explain to you what is the intuition behind this effect. So we propose that when you have to make a joint decision, that basically cues the activation of gender-related norms as guides for how you should behave with other people. So gender norms are common societal expectations about the appropriate behavior and traits of men and women in the society. So how would these gender norms basically impact the different types of diet? Let's start with the mixed gender diet. In the mixed gender diet, there are clear gender differences between the male and the female partner, which basically highlight their masculinity and femininity respectively. Therefore, there is no need for either partner to reassert their gender normative behavior or prove their masculinity or femininity to each other. Therefore, both male and female partners in mixed gender diet lean towards the compromise option as they would do in their individual decisions and we see that they choose compromise options to the same extent as solo consumers. In female-female diet, women don't really feel the strong need to signal their femininity to other women. Research has shown that femininity doesn't require public defense in front of other women. Therefore, women in female-female pairs are unlikely to basically change their baseline tendencies to select the compromise options in their individual decisions. That's why we see that female-female pairs also exhibit the compromise effect. In male-male diets though, research has shown that men have a strong need to demonstrate their masculinity in front of each other. This desire to sort of signal one's masculinity to other men is uh, due to evolved adaptations to an environment in which men had to constantly compete with other men for resources and to constantly demonstrate their masculinity through public actions in front of other men. Therefore, men are particularly likely to engage in actions that signal their masculinity in front of other men, but not so much in front of women. In order to demonstrate their masculinity, research has demonstrated that men often engage in something that is called gender dichotomization because it helps them establish their masculinity. So gender dichotomization is basically rejecting traits and behaviors that are consistent with feminine norms and embracing behaviors and traits that are consistent with masculine norms. So feminine norms, research suggests that feminine norms dictate being moderate, being balanced, being willing to compromise, and being willing to look for the golden middle. On the other hand, masculine norms dictate being assertive, being dominant, being decisive in situations of conflict. So if we go back to the traditional compromise effect choice, we can see that selecting a compromise middle alternative is more consistent with feminine norms. It signals that you're willing to compromise, you're willing to look for a golden middle, 
you select medium performance on the attributes that are important to you. Therefore, in order to oppose feminine norms and de demonstrate their masculinity, both male partners in a male-male pair would lean towards choosing one of the extreme options, which are more consistent with masculine norms. So choosing one of the extreme options signals that you are decisive about which attribute is more important to you. You can make a decision you are assertive, you are dominant. That's more consistent with masculine norms. So in order for men to demonstrate their masculinity to each other, when they make these joint decisions together, the two decision makers are likely to oppose the compromise option and lean towards one of the extreme options. Importantly, this theory suggests that if we give male-male pairs an alternative way to signal their masculinity to each other, we might be able to prompt them to select compromise options to the same extent as other diets and individual decision makers. And that's exactly what we are going to do in the last empirical investigation that I'm going to show you today. So in this study, we had three different types of pairs, three different types of diets. First, we had the intervention male-male pairs, which were basically given the opportunity to signal their masculinity to each other via alternative means prior to making the focal choice. The way we did that is we asked them to select one magazine as a reward for their participation in the study. As you can see on the screen, the selection of magazines a range from extremely feminine magazines such as Cosmopolitan to extremely masculine magazines such as Men's Health and Muscle and Fitness. All male-male pairs selected one of the extremely masculine magazines and this choice successfully satisfied their masculinity signaling goals. In other words, they were able to demonstrate their masculinity to each other by going for one of these extremely masculine options here, which subsequently decreased their need to demonstrate their masculinity in the focal choice that we're going to examine. So as you can see, the intervention male-male diet first had the opportunity to satisfy their masculinity signaling goals via an alternative means, and then they made six focal compromise effect choices. I'm going to show them to you in a second. The regular male-male pair, the procedure for them was reversed, meaning that they first completed the focal choices and then they did the magazine selection task. So the regular male-male pairs didn't have the opportunity to satisfy their masculinity signaling goals prior to the focal choices. So we expect them to behave in the same way as the male-male pairs in all prior studies. And then we have female-female pairs, which we used as a reference point. They did the focal choices, product choices first, and then they did the magazine selection task last. Here are the different choices that, that participants in these studies had, had to make. So we asked them to select among three different hotels, three different flashlights, tires, printers, toothpaste, and headphones. Basically, we wanted to see that the effect would emerge across different categories. Here you can see the percentage choosing the compromise option. First, let's look at the regular male-male diets that didn't have the opportunity to signal their masculinity to each other prior to the focal choice. 44% of them chose the compromise option across the, the six different choices. Female, female pair, 67% of them chose the compromise option. So we can see that here we replicate what we saw in the study so far. Female, female pairs more likely to go for compromise options than male, male decision makers making joint decisions together. Interestingly, we see that when male decision makers are given the opportunity to signal their masculinity in some alternative way prior to the focal choice, they are as likely to go for the compromise option as female-female pairs, and significantly more likely to do so than the regular male-male pair. So that suggests that it's the need to signal their masculinity that drives this effect, but it also provides a way in which we can mitigate these tendencies by providing alternative ways to re-establish masculinity or signal masculinity to one's partner. So just to summarize the key insights, we see that the compromise effect is a robust phenomena in the yadic choices. So any decision-making pair that involves 
a female decision maker exhibits the compromise effect, we don't see it in male-male decision-making pairs. Men in male-male diets basically use extreme options as a way to signal their masculinity to each other. And we also don't see any enhancement of the compromise effect in female diets. One might argue that since the compromise option is more consistent with feminine norms, we might see that women are even more likely to go for the compromise option when they make decisions with other women, but we don't see that. Rather, we see similar magnitudes as in individual decision makers because women don't have this need to signal their femininity to each other. So the present research has important practical implications for marketers because the compromise effect is usually used by marketers for assortment planning, for product positioning, and to shift consumers' preferences in predictable ways. So just to go back to our initial question, is designing choices based on the compromise effect always effective for marketers? The answer is no. It really depends on what your target audience is. So marketers need to understand whether their target audience is likely to make individual or dyadic decisions. They need to understand the gender composition of the decision-making pairs and customize their choice sets based on the target audience. Let me just give you an example about how these insights can be applied by a travel and vacation planning company such as TripAdvisor. So if TripAdvisor is offering recommendations for solo travelers, they can increase the sales of the most profitable option by making it the middle compromise alternative. So for example, if you have solo travelers and you're making recommendations looking for a trip to reward yourself, the most profitable option should be in the middle because we know that consumers would likely go for the middle option here. The same would hold true if you have a mixed gender pair looking, for example, for a romantic getaway. Or if you have a women's getaway, a pair that is looking for a women's getaway. Again, making the, making the most profitable option, the one that you want to increase the sales of, the middle option will work very well. However, when offering recommendations to male-male pairs, for example, a men's getaway, it will be more effective for marketers to make the target option, the most profitable option, to be one of the extreme options rather than the middle options. Because we see what we see in our research is that male-male pairs are likely to go for one of the extreme options. The same insights could be applied in other products and service categories. So for example, this advice could be useful for car salespeople, for real estate agents, for financial planners, who really have the opportunity to customize the presented choices based on their clients. Similarly, websites such as OpenTable, Airbnb, Expedia, that really have the opportunity to customize the position of the different options based on the consumers would find that, would, would probably find these insights useful. And beyond the applications for marketers, I would like to discuss some broader implications of this research that might be valuable across different industries. For example, the research might have some implications about team creation in the workplace. Managers interested with building successful teams in the workplace might benefit from our findings in the following way. So if two men are deciding, for example, on a corporate strategy, they might be more likely to go for an all-in approach or take some cards off the table. If a woman is involved in the decision making, moderate parts are more likely to be taken. So if a firm wants to foster more extreme decisions, creating male-male decision making pairs or male-male teams may promote this objective to a greater extent than relying on individual decisions. On the other hand, if a firm wants to foster more moderate decisions, managers would include more women in decision making, which should go without saying, or rely more on individual decisions. Our findings also suggest that men and women might have different approaches to negotiations. So think about the salary negotiation as a type of joint decision where you have two people who have to agree on one outcome. 
So men negotiating with one another would probably likely, very likely start at extreme low and high numbers and struggle to find a compromise. On the other hand, women might try to begin with a number that seems more reasonable, but in fact may leave money on the table if they don't consider opening with a more extreme offer. So what we suggest is that both men and women need to be aware of their tendencies and think about the reasoning behind their behavior rather than just defaulting to a moderate or extreme position that feels comfortable to them given their decision-making partner. So that concludes my presentation on how gender impacts joint decision-making. Now I would like to switch gears and share a few key insights from some of my other research projects. So a lot of my um, other work focuses on financial decision-making and one is in one of our recent research projects, we examine financial infidelity. Basically, the likelihood or the tendency of consumers to hide spending, savings, income from their spouses. And we look at how financial infidelity might impact consumption choices and also the couple's ability to reach joint financial goals. In another project, we look at how uh, successes in joint goal pursuits might actually sabotage future goal progress. So feeling that you and your spouse have succeeded in your retirement goal the prior month might actually license people with high decision-making power to stop working towards that financial goal in the future. In another domain, I look at volunteering and donations. And what we find here is that when you ask pairs of consumers to donate time, they are significantly less likely to donate time than individuals. So a lot of these volunteering initiatives for couples might actually hurt nonprofit organizations because decision-making pairs are less willing to donate time than individuals. And lastly, with respect to product choices, we find that consumers, when they have to make decisions in diet, they make more unethical decisions together. And we also find that Reviews for solo experiences seem to be more persuasive than reviews for joint decisions. And that concludes my presentation for today. I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Justina. That, that is great. Uh, a reminder for the audience that you can send your questions directly through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we do have a number of questions that came in during your presentation. Um, one of the first was maybe to go back and give a little bit more detail about how the dyad experiments were done. Uh, so, for example, uh, one person was asking, uh, were all the other characteristics of the individuals other than gender controls? So in other words, were they matched by age and other factors, ethnicity and so forth, that might affect the decision making? Yes, yeah, so basically participants were randomly assigned to the different types of diet. So any of these uh, different characteristics such as age, ethnicity, and any other demographic should be random across the different conditions and should just present noise in, in the data. Okay, they were so the relatively similar in age. Participants were relatively similar in age. And we know that the gender composition, the ethnicity composition of the three different types of gender diets were similar. Okay, so it was essentially randomization to control for right. factors right. other than gender. Okay, um, and I had a question I think is related, and that is, uh, were uh, the diets that each individual indicate his or her preference independently of the others, or were there any kind of sequencing effects? Because that presumably could affect, especially in the male-male diets, if one chose one option, did that suggest that the other would choose a different option just to be different. So were, there, were you controlling the sequence by which they either made or learned about the other person's choice? So participants were asked to come to one joint decision. So they were asked to discuss <clears throat> the options and come to one joint decision that represented both of them. They were not asked to make the decision individually. Um, in what order they express their preferences, we don't have any uh, data that talks about the dynamics, but um, what we were interested in is what is the outcome of the decision. I see. Okay. So, um, in effect, that could also be a random effect across the different diets. Right. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether one, one man spoke before the other, the, the observed right. effect was that when you had two men in the, in the diet, 
they were doing the male demonstrations. Um, I had a re uh, related question about the uh, example where you try to uh, control for that effect or, or change that dynamic by having them select the magazines. Did you observe uh, which magazines were selected in the situation where they made the choice of the product first and then selected a magazine? Did the, did the choice of the product sort of diffuse the male competition and lead to a, a more of a, uh, a broader choice of magazines? You're, you're exactly right. Sir. Yes. So they were very likely to choose one of the extreme options when the magazine selection test came first, but they were their preferences were broader when they did the focal choices. So they sort of signaled their masculinity in the focal choices, and that decreased their preferences for one of the extreme masculine magazines. So you're exactly right. So that's a nice confirmation of the signaling right. effect, that once it's been sort of diffused, then it doesn't have, you don't have to do it again, as it were. <laughs> right, you have already signaled to the other person what kind of person you are, so it doesn't have to carry to the next choice. That, that suggests also another type of intervention, perhaps, for marketers, especially maybe in entertainment, other kind of settings where you could have some kind of a signaling and then proceed to the main event, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions, Chandra had a question about whether or not the male-male diet skewed toward the cheap option, but but I'm hearing you say it was not necessarily the cheapest option. It was they go to the extremes, both cheaper and more expensive. Right. So they go for one of the extremes. They were almost equally split among the cheapest and the, the most expensive one. So it's more about showing that you're decisive about what is more important. Is it the size? Is it the price? Is it the cooking area that is more important for you? And it doesn't matter whether it's the cheapest or the most expensive. And also remember that we see the effect even in choice sets that don't include price as one of the attributes. We also measured whether the importance of the attributes was the same for male and female decision makers, and it was the same. So it wasn't the, the case that male decision makers simply preferred one of the, the attributes. Oh, that's interesting because I had another related question which I think relates to another one or two of the, the questions from the audience. And that is, um, you demonstrated this effect across a variety of categories. Uh, was it only, uh, was it more noticeable, let's say, depending on the price of, uh, you know, uh, toothpaste or mouthwash, whatever, versus a vacation, very different price points. So is the effect pretty much uniform across that range of categories by, by price and, and maybe involvement in the decision? Or, or is it more uh, do you see it more in some situations than others so i would say that we probably have a very limited range of involvement in the decision so probably all of them are low to medium involvement so we didn't see any difference across the different types of choices but maybe if you have more expensive bigger decisions it would be interesting to see whether the effects would emerge to the same extent because you can imagine that when you have maybe a more involving decision, men might be thinking more about the specific decision rather than about signaling their masculinity. Uh, maybe a related question would be, um, in the situation where as a consumer, I'm not as familiar with the product or maybe there's more inherent uncertainty, you know, experienced goods versus more tangible products and things, um, maybe a compromise solution is sort of like a hedge. It, it may or may not be a signal about my male dominance or something. So I'm wondering, are, are there some categories maybe or given the, the degree of, of uncertainty or expertise of the consumer that might moderate that effect of where, a, in other words, a compromise choice would appear reasonable, maybe even in male-male diets? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. So that's exactly why I guess the, the compromise effect emerges in individual decisions because it makes people feel more comfortable about their choice. You're cho choosing something that offers medium performance on all considered attributes uh, and then it's easier to justify that choice so it's possible that that would occur in other categories but i still think that regardless of what the category is that would occur to the same extent in the different types of diets and we'll still see a difference between the male male decision making pairs and the female female decision making pairs because if the category maybe if we have a category that is completely unfamiliar to men we might be seeing some attenuation of this effect as you suggest that's a good point actually right yeah. um, one of the things i was struck by the whole premise of your research is that it it points up something we're seeing a lot from uh marketing science institute corporate members and that is uh 
decision making, as you point out, not just with consumers, but certainly in B2B situations is a team decision or joint decision making almost by definition. And so Gina had a question about whether or not some of these uh, effects would play out uh, based on your experience in uh, B2B purchase decisions, say around software, where there might be different uh, perspectives from the IT uh, finance, you know, different uh, functions that are helping make a decision jointly. What would your thoughts be about how this might play out in those sort of B2B joint decision-making contexts? I think the research is very relevant to a B2B joint decision-making context. As we can see in one of the studies that I shared with you, we had printers, which would be a type of equipment that maybe uh, occur, uh, is a B2B purchase decision. So as long as you have a pair of male decision-makers, I'll probably expect the same effect to occur. And we also have some studies that I didn't have time to share with you since you mentioned finances with portfolio choices. Again, we see the same sort of choices when people have to trade risk and reward. I think that's related to something you said towards the end that uh, some of your wider implications of this research about decisions by teams that maybe having a more female input to the decision would, meet, would lead to more moderate uh, outcomes. There's a, a well-known phenomenon in group decision-making, so-called risky shift, that if some individual stakes out a position, then others in competing with that become more and more extreme, and you end up with a result that is more extreme than any one individual might have arrived at on their own. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that's uh, the dynamics here are similar, and is that something maybe that a male-dominated team is going to exacerbate? It could be, yeah, it could be. Uh, I think uh, it's probably more likely to occur in bigger groups than diet. So we examine only pairs. So I think this process that you explain is more likely to occur in bigger groups. It is possible that the male-male pairs are actually exacerbating this exact same process just to go to more extremes. But that wouldn't explain why if you give them a masculinity signaling choice before they make the focal choices, why they exhibit the compromise effect. That shouldn't change the dynamic in any way. Uh, so I still think there is the component of masculinity signaling that drives this effect. I have a, a maybe a little more speculative question for you, um, and that is uh, you, uh, in some of your examples, you used uh, consumer reviews as part of the description of the choice that was being made, uh, travel arrangements and so forth. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, consumer perceptions of um, you know, the use, I guess, well, maybe not always, but where the gender of the reviewer is available or, or made obvious that that would affect the decision, make the credibility uh, that people would lend to consumer reviews. I'm just trying to kind of extrapolate from your diet examples to mm -hmm. consumers evaluating other consumers' reviews. Do you think gender is going to have the same sort of impact? For sure. Yeah, there is actually some research that shows that social distance between the reviewer and the person reading the review was um, determined to what extent people trust the review. So if you are a male decision maker and you see uh, another male decision maker writing a review for the same product that you're considering, there is less social distance between you and the reviewer, so you are more likely to trust that review. So it would, it would definitely play a role in that. And um, in some of um, my other projects, we look at uh, whether the, the reviewer experienced the product jointly versus individually and how that impacts the likelihood of using the, the, the review for individual and joint decision makers. Okay, and maybe just another sort of somewhat speculative uh, uh, question to you. Uh, we've seen some research that we put into our working paper series here about the influence of, of social networks, kind of the virtual influence, and the notion that you could be influenced by your social group, even if they're not actually physically co-present with you in the decision. Of course, these days with mobile devices and things, you can sort of bring your friends with you as you shop or make decisions. Just your thoughts about how some of those dynamics might play out as people are affected by the wider social networks, but in that sort of virtual way, which seems to be more and more feasible these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly a very interesting, uh, I would say, direction for future research that we can undertake from here. So basically what you're asking is whether like virtual social presence would have the same impact as having to make the decision with somebody else. And I would probably speculate that uh, if your choice is visible to others and if you have the goal to signal your masculinity, if you know that the observer is a male and you're male, we're probably likely to see the same dynamic. 
That's great. Well, I, I appreciate, again, uh, the thought that went into the presentation, your response to the questions, uh, the engagement from the audience. It's really been great. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, there's uh, on the screen now you'll see uh, Christina's uh, email address. Feel free to reach out to her with additional questions or comments, suggestions. Uh, for those of you who are MSI members, we'll also send a link following this to uh, the poster presentation that Christina did at our recent uh, trustees meeting here uh, at MSI, and there's uh, more details about some of the, the uh, research that she cited towards the end of her presentation. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the audience for joining us today and Christina for her presentation. We'll be sending out a recording of this webinar soon. And if you have additional questions, again, feel free to follow up with her. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that since 1961, nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges. Again, thanks for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next lunch lecture.